Good morning. Good morning. Gotcha. I hope you had a great evening last night, and I hope you're looking forward to a wonderful day of engagement today. I'm going to be really brief because I think you all are in for a treat this morning with our, our speaker. So I'm Alfred Mays. I am the Chief Diversity Officer and Strategist with the Burroughs Welcome Fund. The Burroughs Welcome Fund has been a longtime supporter of the STEM learning ecosystem community of practice, and this year is no exception. We, like the STEM ecosystems, are committed to student enrichment and promoting innovation in science and mathematics. And in the broadest sense, we're committed to education equity, improving overall human health through education, empowering discovery in frontiers of greatest need. This morning, it is my unique honor and privilege to introduce to you someone who is at the forefront of education and discovery, as well as access and opportunity. Captain Barrington Irvin is the first black person to fly around the world solo. And he did this in a plane that he built himself. Let me repeat that. <laughs> Captain Irvin did this in a plane that he built himself. I don't think there are any efficacy issues uh, with, with Captain Irvin. His nonprofit, Experience Aviation, inspires young people to identify and pursue their dreams through dynamic aviation education programs designed to build math, science, reading, and problem solving skills. His journey inspires thousands of underserved and underrepresented students each year, and now it's your turn to be inspired by Captain Irvin's story. I introduce to you Captain Barrington Irvin. At the age of 19, he learned to fly and forever touched the sky. At 21, he launched nonprofit Experience Aviation. At 23, he became by far the youngest person to fly around the world solo. At 24, he challenged 60 students to build an airplane and piloted its test flight. At 26, he received the NASA Trailblazer Award. At 28, he was one of 15 adventurers selected as a National Geographic Emerging Explorer. At 30, he launched Flying Classroom. He is a mentor, educator, humanitarian, and inspirational pilot. He is Captain Barrington Irving. Born in Kingston, Jamaica, raised in Miami's inner city, his life changed forever when he met Captain Gary Robinson. He's an amazing football player. Already at that age, had colleges looking for him. And was doing very well in school. And so I said, hey, have you ever thought about flying? And he said, I'm not smart enough to fly. And his response to me not only provoked interest in aviation, but that interest in aviation turned into passion. Barrington comes to me one day and says, I want to be the youngest pilot and the first pilot to fly around the world solo. When I met him, I basically said, what are you talking about that you want to fly around the world? On March 23rd, 2007, Barrington took off in his Columbia 400 named Inspiration. 97 days later, on June 27th, he returned. All of us in tears just at the gift of him coming home safely. And when I opened that cockpit door, I immediately knew that was my responsibility, was to empower young people. So what did I do? I literally surrounded myself with the business aviation community and we started to create programs within Experience Aviation, STEM Plus programs. What the plus represents, how do you use aviation to achieve your highest self? We knew that we had an opportunity to create a revolution in education and I felt Barrington was that person. How could we tie the real world into the classroom? I think that's exactly what he's doing. Barrington always reaches to the next level. Thank you, Barrington, for broadening my horizon on my outlook of aviation. I wouldn't be where I am without Barrington as far as a line service technician. Barrington Irving is a superhero, a trailblazer, relentless in changing the world for better. Barrington touched thousands of young people's lives. 
And I saw in those, the eyes of those kids that they had been changed. I believe they too one day could be a Barrington Island. My parents sacrificed a lot. And then my wife and my kids, they believe and give me the opportunity to give to others. The NBAA is proud to present the 2019 American Spirit Award to Captain Barrington Irving. Congratulations, Barrington. True. Live. Fly. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing this morning? Oh, my goodness. I am uh, truly excited to be here, honored to be here. Uh, mentorship is a very real thing. And I purposely say that because uh, I'm grateful to Alfred Mays, who just introduced me, and the Burroughs Welcome Fund. Um, Alfred, thank you. Thank you for being a friend. Thank you for being a mentor. I come up with a ton of crazy ideals and concepts, and uh, Alfred could tolerate me, right? Uh, I, I do also want to recognize the STEM ecosystems, leadership, Exxon. I don't know where uh, she is, but she is amazing. Uh, of course, her team. <laughs> committee members, sponsors, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share a bit this morning. Let me say this, um, I know you guys just watched the video and um, it was saying at the age of this, he did that, at that, he did this. Um, let me put it this way. When I was in school, I had a very fundamental question in life. That question was, when will I actually ever use this stuff, right? Why does it matter? Who honestly cares? Why do I need to learn this? So my journey has kind of led to that and, and constantly pursuing, wanting to investigate these things. I'm very grateful, I don't, I don't know where my team is, but our flying classroom team members, our KSCM over there at the table, very grateful for them. And look, at the end of the day, we believe every child should have amazing experiences. Doesn't matter where they come from, what background they have, how they look, doesn't matter. But how did my experience begin? Well, I was born in Kingston, Jamaica, moved to Miami, Florida at the age of six. And when we came to Miami, Florida, it was 10 of us in a two bedroom home. Of course, we all have different sacrifices we go through in life. And while growing up, you know, we didn't have much. But I played football, I was pretty good at it. I played football for a school called Miami Northwestern Senior High School. And at the time we were ranked number one in the state of Florida, number one in the entire country. So naturally I thought, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go on and play in the NFL, this is my path. But one day I'm in a store and I'm looking out the window and I see this gentleman dressed in this uniform, had no clue what his uniform represented, but he stepped out of a very nice, luxurious truck, <laughs> had a nice watch on, and I'm just looking at him saying to myself, man, that brother looks like he makes a ton of money. <laughs> so he walks into the store, and he sees that I'm staring at him. He approaches me and says to me, hey son, have you ever thought about becoming a pilot? And the first words out of my mouth, I said, sir, I don't think I'm smart enough to fly an aircraft. But I asked him one powerful and pivotal question. I said to him, how much money do you make? <laughs> so he leaned over and he whispered to me, and he said to me, this was back in 2001, he said to me, son, I make $117 an hour. And I looked up at him and it was as if the heavens were behind him. <laughs> and all I could honestly utter out of my mouth, I said, legally? 
And he's like, yes, this is a real job. This is what I do. Now we laugh at that, and that is hilarious. That's where my mindset was. But where was it really? You see, at that point, I didn't care about how much math or science or literacy I had to learn. I was trying to fundamentally understand one thing. And what I was trying to fundamentally understand is, if I decided to pursue this as a career field, what would the quality of my life look like? And he had the wisdom to just flat out tell me, look, this is how much money I make. Why do I mention that point? Because as adults, we are so infatuated with the journey. Yes, it's important, but I'm sorry to tell you, kids don't care about that. What they care about is the destination. And that's what this gentleman was able to sell me. Now, I had interest in aviation, but I needed someone to push me. This was my former high school social studies teacher, Ms. Batiste. I know y'all just gave her a huge round of applause, but let me tell you this. When I was in school, I could, I couldn't absolutely, I couldn't stand this woman when I was in school. <laughs> Ms. Batiste was one of those educators who just saw more potential in me than for even for me to see in myself. And she constantly nagged me and said, Barrington, forget about football, pursue a career in aviation. And she was difficult. You can probably tell by just looking at her face, right? <laughs> Ms. Batiste would constantly say to me, Barrington, forget about football, pursue a career in aviation. She nagged me so much, I ended up turning down my football scholarships to pursue a career in aviation. And at the time, it sounds heroic, but at the time, my coaches, they actually thought I had some type of mental breakdown, so they wanted me to take psychological evaluations. In addition to that, my family, my parents said, son, we don't have money to send you off to college. You just turned down your free ride. You're gonna have to figure out how exactly you're going to be able to pay for school. So Ms. Batiste took me under her wings. She said, Barrington, don't worry about it. I'll help you get into community college. Then I transferred to a four-year historically black college, Florida Memorial University. And that's how my journey to pursue a career in aviation began because of a woman who I couldn't stand that saw more potential in me than I saw in myself. Now, when I said I wanted to fly around the world for two and a half years, people told me no. And how this came about is the gentleman who introduced me to aviation, he said, Barrington, I want you to give back. I'm like, Mr. Robinson, I don't have any money to give. How could I possibly give back? He said, no, son, I want you to share your, share your time, share your knowledge, share your experiences. So I just started going out speaking to kids. And when I started to do that, I said, well, what if I flew around the world to just inspire a whole bunch of students? Knew nothing about setting any records. And I said, well, what if I just told kids about this industry, about aviation? So I started to humbly save up money, put together proposals, start sending it off to companies. Well, what you see here on the screen is one of my rejection letters. Notice in this letter from Coca-Cola, which I just find to be hilarious, they say to me, here at the headquarters, we focus on events and programs that are national or international in scope when considering sponsorship requests. I'm sorry, but what the hell do you call flying around the world? You can't get more national or international in scope than that. So I realized people weren't paying attention to what I was trying to do. This is my most prized asset. So the one pair of dress shoes I owned at the time. With three holes in the bottom of these shoes, I wore them to major aviation events like this one. Walking from booth to booth, trying to figure out how exactly will I be able to fly around the world. 
Now, in order to fly around the world, the first thing you need is an airplane. This was the aircraft I flew around the world in, cost $650,000. I couldn't convince anyone to lend me a plane, let me borrow one, lease one, rent one, nothing. So I was sitting down on my bedroom floor, frustrated. Then I had this light bulb moment, and I said to myself, when people steal cars, what do they do with them? I know some of y'all know, when people steal cars, <laughs> what do they actually do with them? All right, they go to, to the chop shop. They sell the parts. For those of you who don't know what the chop shop is, it's, it's this magical place where they take all the parts from off the vehicle and illegally sell it. I said to myself, if different companies manufacture different parts of a plane, of a car, I wonder if they manufacture different parts of a plane. Sure enough, that was the case. And I studied 42 different companies and approached them one by one and simply asked them for the one part they manufactured. And that's how I utilized Street Hustle to get my hands on a $650,000 aircraft. Flying around the world was very challenging. I had no weather radar, no de-icing. At that time, I actually didn't know how to swim. And I would sit in this position for as long as 12, 14, 16 hours at a time. Very grueling. The youngest person to fly around the world prior to me was 37 years of age. I worked with an amazing group of people to pull this off at the age of 23. And Ended up becoming the youngest person to fly solo around the world and the first black man to do it. And then things started to change. When you're sitting in a plane for 10, 12, 14, 16 hours at a time, you start to become more in tune with what's going on around you. Maybe philosophical in some cases, but you start to look at things in different ways. Now, what you see here on the screen is a, a, an important chart that we utilize in aviation. And I started to look at these charts quite differently. In this chart, do you see math? Absolutely. Is there science there? Sure is. What about literacy? 100%. I started to say to myself, why is it when I was in school? I had to learn these subjects in a fragmented manner. You see, for me, these subjects had very little meaning because they were isolated. I wasn't forced to utilize them simultaneously in an integrated manner to do some amazing things. And I started to look at education quite differently. So I want you to look at this video. We'll turn down the volume a little bit, but do you see a runway in front of you? No, okay. Now we use this chart and every element of it to safely fly in and out of places. Do you see a runway in front of you? Okay. Now, what about now? Do you see a runway in front of you? Okay, see, when we come in and do this, we're coming in at close to 200 miles per hour. And this is what STEM looks like in the real world. Any part of that chart you get wrong, you're dead. Any part of it you get wrong, you're dead. Now, I started looking at these different experiences. I'm traveling around the world. My eyes are like just open. I'm seeing things and my eyes are just like, what do I need to do? And I'm sure for all of us in this room, we have different experiences as adults, whether we travel or we go out and explore certain things. And I started to ask myself a few questions. What you see here on the screen is an aircraft cockpit. Yes, it's an older aircraft. Most human beings, you put them inside of an airplane 
And they'll typically fixate on one, two, maybe three instruments. Now, all the instruments are important in order for you to safely fly from point A to point B. But I started asking myself the question, when it comes to our young people, what do we practically need to do? Yes, we have to bring all of these subjects to life, but what needs to happen? I started to say to myself, the platform of delivery needs to change. Here's another aircraft cockpit. More modern, right? But what's the difference? The platform has changed. Why do I bring that up? If we think what worked pre-COVID with our kids is going to work post-COVID with our kids, we have a new thing coming. Why do I say that? What's the one thing not only our kids experience, but adults experience? Well, think about it. Even my own kids. I have Irish triplets. That's another topic. But my kids started to say to me, Papa, why do we need to go to school? Why do we need to learn this? Why do we? They started evaluating certain things about their learning experience. They even started to add up the time of, OK, we got to get ready for school. Then when we go to school, you have homeroom. You deduct the time for lunch. And then you got to get picked up from school. So really, you only have about four, maybe five really good, valuable hours of school. What were they doing? They were defining their time. But they were defining it differently. They were defining the value of their time. You see, here's what kids realize. They experienced during COVID the most ultimate form of freedom. No longer can you lock me in a room and force me to learn. And they started to re-evaluate re the meaning and purpose of their time. I fly around privately. Why do I do that? Because I want to be a Kardashian? No. It allows me to be in multiple places within a short period of time. Not only for myself, but also for our team. So if kids are evaluating the value of their time, I started to step back and, 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 and say, all right, I, we have to take a totally different approach. So after I flew around the world, I started to work with young people. And this was the first project we did. We challenged 60 kids from failing schools to build this airplane from scratch in 10 weeks. I promised them that if they would build it from scratch in 10 weeks, I would fly it. Now, mathematically, it was impossible for them to build a plane in 10 weeks. Just wasn't enough hours in the program for them to do it. But here's what started to happen. Kids were asking their guardians, hey, can we stay here till 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at night? Can we stay here till 10 o'clock at night, midnight? And these were kids from six, there were 60 students from failing schools in Miami who we brought together to build this airplane from scratch in 10 weeks. And when they built it, I had to fly it. How many of you guys would fly an airplane that your students built? Okay, question answered, right? So we ended up flying the airplane. This became a tremendous success kind of launched us in education. And look, we just fundamentally believe it doesn't matter where you come from, how you look, whatever the case may be, anyone can achieve their highest self through STEM+. Plus. Then we started working with fifth graders through eighth graders, and we challenged them to build a car faster than a Ferrari 430 Spider. And they were able to do that. So we're doing all of these things with young people getting them to build airplanes, race cars, hovercrafts. 
And we just started to look at the world differently. So for example, it's a young lady I mentored who ended up becoming the youngest woman to fly solo around the world. What? Thank you. So remember I tell you about my former high school teacher, I couldn't stand Ms. Batiste. I'm super excited, I call up Ms. Batiste, and I said to Ms. Batiste, Ms. Batiste, I think I got it. I think I figured out a way to engage students and empower teachers. She immediately says to me on the other side of the phone, she said, boy, I don't care what you do. <laughs> and I'm on the other side of the phone line saying, see, this is why I can't stand this woman behind, right? <laughs> Ms. Batiste says to me, boy, I don't care what you do. If you can't engage my kids in the first 15 seconds of class, why does it matter? What was Ms. Batiste telling me? Mm. Make, it relevant. Make it relevant. What else? Make it engaging. What else? You know what she was really telling me? She was explaining to me Barrington, the first thing you're in the business of doing in education is sales. We talk about equity. We talk about diversity. We talk about inspiration. We talk about motivation. We talk about all these things in education, but we forget the one core concept that drives everything else. If I can't sell you on what you're about to learn, why does it matter? We can't forget that significant piece of the equation. You remember what I asked the airline pilot? How much money do you make? And what did he do in turn? He sold me on a career field where I didn't care about how much math, how much science, how much literacy I had to learn because he first sold me on the finish line. You see, one of the things that I struggled with in education, and this is of no insult, this is of no insult to our industry or field. But when I was starting to get kids alongside with our team to build airplanes, build race cars, and do all these things. A lot of folks in education, they were coming up to me asking me, how are you getting kids to do this? At the time, I was only 24 years old. And I'm just looking at them very puzzled because I'm saying to myself, well, I used to skip school half the time. How are you, you know, asking me this question? And I started to realize, yes, we can do the studies. Yes, we can do the research. But how is it companies out there, whether it's Nike, Verizon, you name it, how is it they have figured out how to captivate the mind of a child? But the one industry that should know how to do it is the one that struggles the most. Our kids are not complicated. I'm going to say it again. Our kids are not complicated. We are. I'm going to go further into that, but let me first play this video of some of what we do at Flying Classroom. Flying Classroom Lead Explorers and Explorers. I just want to welcome you guys to our brand new where it's coming. Brand new school year. Flying Classroom is about to launch version 3.0 of our online portal. You're gonna find a number of new expeditions our team accomplished all over the world. Quick question, are you ready to engage and see us bring the world to your classroom? Are you ready to explore? And are you ready to innovate? I can't wait to see your engineer. 
It's coming again. And design challenges, and for you all to realize your very own greatness. On to our next adventure, Blue Sky. So let me run through a few things real quickly, right? Because at the end of the day, we believe that if we can create the right experiences, then we can sell students on what they're about to learn. Yes, it's the obvious things kids love. You could go fast, you could kill yourself, you could blow up. Yes, all of those components are tied into it. But at the end of the day, we all want a good story that we can identify with. Let me share this for example. We wanted to teach students about parasites because during the time of COVID, there was a lot of fear around different things. I want you to notice this wasp injected something into this caterpillar. Now this caterpillar survives this process, then its mind is controlled, right? And the larvae comes out of its body. Now the caterpillar survives this process. And then the, its mind is controlled to spin a cocoon and protect the larvae that just came out of its body. Why? There's a different type of parasitic wasp that wants to get to that larvae. Now, part of the reason why we wanted to explore this was to teach students in a different manner. Notice this ant, its body was infected by a plant, and the plant uses the dead tissue of the ant to grow that spore. Then the wind will carry that spore, and the plant could reproduce. There are certain crickets, certain worms, I should say, who want to get to a new water source. So what do they do? Infect the body of a cricket, control the cricket's mind, force the cricket to go for a few miles to a new water source, drowns the cricket, and then the worm has a new home. Y'all looking at me like, dang, I really thought you were going to talk about flying today, right? <laughs> there were a lot of stigmas around us. We wanted to teach kids, well, what does it actually take for a virus to pass from an animal to a human being? Yes, as Americans, we may laugh and judge and say, well, eating a bat. Who could do that? But we don't understand even our great, great, great ancestors eating bats was a key part of their own diets. So we started to work with students and explore these things in different manners. What are we looking at here? You guys are looking at, I don't know anymore. I, I, I don't know where we're going. I don't know where we came from. I, I honestly don't know anymore. Well, let me play this quick video. You might have to click the screen to, to play the video. Let's see. All right, here we go. So I want you to notice this young lady. She just finished speaking to her friend and then she calls an Uber. But she does something interesting after she speaks with her friend and she walks towards a building and then she goes inside of the building and gets into an elevator. Why would you do this? Well, Ubers are about to go airborne. What you're looking at here is called an eVTOL, an electrical vertical takeoff and land vehicle. Now, why would Uber do this? Well, one of the things that kills their business is rush hour traffic. So I said, why not use the tops of buildings to transport people from point A to point B, get them there much faster, and make more money while they do it? This is its existence in real life. When will we tell our kids this story? Right? We firmly believe, look, what our students receive and the experiences our students have, so should our educators. Now, there's a couple of things I quickly want to touch on. Yes, there's the obvious things of <clears throat> creating experiences through materials, working with students where we explore the world in different capacities and so forth. But there are some important things that I want to share.
In education, we're going through some very real challenges. And let me tell you this. People in general love the perception of creating change. You understand what I just said? People love the perception of creating change. But how many individuals will truly sacrifice to create the change? Our young people, they want experiences. They want to see dynamic things and they want to experience powerful things in the classroom. Don't tell me what I have to learn. Show me through an experience what I need to learn. Think about it. In education, the first thing we're responsible of doing, yes, is sales. But part of the sales is to do what? Create a production. Someone creates a play, someone creates a movie. Do they say to themselves, oh, you know what? Uh, my audience, well, I'm going to be working with some rural students here. I'm going to be working with some low-income students here. I might have some gifted and talented. No. You use the experiences to level the playing field. You see, it's us as adults who make things a lot more complicated than it needs to be. Christ himself had many believers. How many disciples did he have? The times that we're in, the times that we are in, will challenge us as adults in the equation where we're going to have to figure out certain things. But in figuring out certain things, right, we cannot make this mistake. We cannot confuse effort with results. Because there are those who say, well, I did this and I did that. Well, what's the result? Don't tell me, oh, well, these kids don't want to listen. Oh, they'll listen. I was one of those hard-headed students. But the greater question is, what did you create for them to want to listen? What did you create for them to want to engage? It's not that complicated. At the end of the day, any human being wants a dynamic experience. There is what we study, there's what we research, and there's what we execute. With that said, I want to thank you guys this morning for the opportunity to share. And I want to say thank you to STEM Ecosystems. Thank you, Alfred and the Burroughs Welcome Fund. Be blessed.